Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Alliance Bernstein. Since 2019, employees have impacted our community by giving more than 5,000 hours of volunteerism in Middle Tennessee. AllianceBernstein.com. Alliance Bernstein is not affiliated with National Public Radio. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. We have a lot of avid readers here at WPLN. It makes sense, right? We stay up on the news and events that we report to you, and hence, we do a lot of reading. If you happen across senior producer Steve Harouche's desk, you'll find basically a mini library, which reminds me to ask him if he charges late fees. I have a couple books I borrowed. But in all seriousness, the love of literature has always been strong in Nashville. And since 1989, the Southern Festival of Books have been a big part of that bringing hundreds of authors and thousands of readers together for free every fall. Later this hour, we'll explore what's in store for this year's event. But first, it's time for Add Us. Each week, we take time to read the comments so you don't have to. Yes, I'm encouraging you to literally add us on Twitter at ThisIsNashville and on Instagram at ThisIsNashville underscore WPLN. Joining me now with a look back at the past week is our digital lead, Anna Gallegos-Cannon. Hey, Anna. Hey, Khalil. Happy thir- Wednesday. Today's Wednesday, not Thursday. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, okay, so it's, it's obviously you guys have gotten the point. It's the, the Wednesday and not Thursday. And our show is almost certainly going to be preempted tomorrow by a January 6th congressional hearing. And we can't go a week without doing at us, right? Of course not. That's right. So on Monday was Indigenous Peoples Day. And in honor of the day, we re-aired our April episode about Middle Tennessee's native roots. Now, after the show, we got an email from a listener saying that we got something wrong, that, in fact, Indigenous Peoples Day is a federal holiday. Now, we love when our listeners pay attention to the details. But, Anna, is this listener right? So I wanted to fact check this. And Indigenous Peoples Day is not. A federal holiday, Mm -hmm. as we said in the episode. But I understand why our listener was confused. So last year, President Biden issued a presidential proclamation recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day. But really, only Congress has the ability to create federal holidays. And right now, if anyone's curious, there's actually two bills aiming to make Indigenous Peoples Day an actual federal holiday. We got another email about that episode from our listener, Mary. She says she was born and raised here in Nashville and as someone who has Native American ancestry is very interested in hearing more shows on indigenous Tennessee. Don't worry, Mary. We completely agree. We've got an episode next Monday, in fact, on the Trail of Tears. So tune in for that. All right. What else are our listeners talking about? So we received an interesting comment from a former guest about last week's show on LGBT affirming churches. Phil Michael Thomas, who was on our uh, episode about gay culture in Nashville way back when, Mm -hmm. (laughs) wrote to us to say that he was grateful for the episode about affirming churches, but wanted to point something out. We didn't mention Edge Hill United Methodist Church in the Vanderbilt area. Phil Michael points out that this was the first reconciling congregation in not only Nashville, but in Tennessee as a whole. Hmm. So here's what he wrote to us. He wrote, quote, there's a banner right in the corner of the sanctuary of of an LGBT uh, Q flag. This flag is taken down and used to march in every pride parade Nashville has ever had. In fact, decades ago, when MCC, the Metropolitan Community Church, the first actual gay church in Nashville, was starting, the members would meet at a separate time for worship at Edge Hill. The founding pastor, Bill Barnes, of the Bill, of the Bards Affordable um, House Fund, uh, started Edge Hill in the community knowing on one side was the poor, poor people, and on the other side were wealthy people. Mm-hmm. Every Sunday, um, anyone, regardless of their secu- sexual orientation, is reminded that, quote, everyone has a place at the table. Thanks for that, Phil Michael. That's really cool to know. We, we got another email about that episode, too, recommending even more LGBTQ affirming congregations in our area, like the Center for Spiritual Living. Unity of Music City and Unity of Nashville. He also added that we should explore New Thought, the New Thought movement in a further episode. And that sounds pretty interesting. That would 
be really interesting. But um, by the way, we got a map in Thursday's episode post of some of the LGBTQ affirming churches in our area. Uh, you can check this out on thisisnashville.org uh, by clipping, clicking on the all episode buttons and then scrolling to Thursday's episode's post. Um, I should say that the majority of them are Christian churches, but if any of our listeners know of other faiths that have queer spaces, you know, always send a message my way and I will happily add it to our map. It is so cool and good that we have a, that resource. So keep sending us your comments, everybody. Now, after yesterday's show on Loretta Lynn's legacy, David Hooper tweeted us at This Is Nashville to say, quote, the pill was groundbreaking for women in the genre. People talk about the forward thinking women in country music today, which is true. But in the 70s, it was a much bigger risk to do something like this. And Loretta Lynn set the standard for what was possible, end quote. Yeah, Loretta Lynn really pushed boundaries for women in country music. Her her lyrics were incredibly clever, and even though she never used profanity in her songs, at least eight of them were still banned from the radio, hmm. including The Pill, Rated X, uh, Don't Come Home a Drinking. And you know what? I think that's really impressive for her time. She was way ahead of her time, and it was uh, it was really great to know a little, learn a little bit more about mm-hmm. her legacy and who she was. Thanks to our digital lead, Anna Gallegos Cannon, for this roundup. Anna. We'll see you soon. And our listeners know where to find me online. (laughs) Don't forget to add us. You can add us on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever day you want. Just be sure to add us on Twitter and Instagram. And let's keep the comments coming. Also, fill out our community survey to let us know what topics you want us to cover at thisisnashville.org. It's super easy and quick, and it helps us produce shows with your needs and interests in mind. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll hear from some of the people who are bringing us the 34th annual Southern Festival of Books. Do you plan to attend this year's festival? What author are you most looking forward to seeing? Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for PrEP and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. If you are a book lover, this is your time. Not only do some of the biggest titles come out this time of year in the fall, but it's also the time for the Southern Festival of Books. Getting to see your favorite authors in person and hear firsthand what inspires them, that's an experience book lovers relish. And it's just one part of what the festival offers for free. To give us the lowdown on what is in store for this year's 34th installment, I'd like to welcome my first guests. Serenity Gerbman is the director of the Southern Festival of Books, a post she's held for 21 years. And Gloria Ballard has been involved with the festival for more than a decade. Serenity, Gloria, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to This is Nashville. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. being here. Really yeah. a pleasure to have you both. Okay, so the festival is back in person for the first time since 2019. Serenity, how excited are you to be back on the plaza again? Oh, my gosh. I'm I'm beyond excited. We've got tents going up today. Our staff are all <clears throat> very enthusiastic, pumped, ready to get out there and see people and welcome. We have authors coming from all over the country. We are, we are fired up for it. So tell me, what have the past two years been like as you all have been planning out the festival? Well, I think they've been for us like they've been for a lot of people, which is, you know, weird and stressful. Um, We feel incredibly fortunate that we were able to have two fantastic festivals online and through that introduce a component of the program that allows us to have sessions air on Facebook and YouTube. And that's something that we'll continue to do. That's been an important thing that we learned that you can do that. Um, But... The in-person experience is hard to replicate on the computer, as I think we've all seen and learned. So um, we had a great time doing that. We'll keep doing parts of it, but we're also really pleased to be back together in person. So as the pandemic was going on and you had to revert to a more virtual festival, what type of setbacks did you all encounter? Well, I think the first year was pretty simple because we knew early on that we were going to be online and we just had to figure out how do you do events online? 
And um, we were really lucky to get connected with great producers. And we have a great staff member, Patrick Schaffner, who speaks that language really well and got us, you know, in the position to do that successfully. Last year was tougher because we didn't know until pretty late in the game that we were not going to be in person. Um, we were we were on a sort of a dual track where we thought, and eh, we might have to to shift to online, so we'll be prepared for that. But we were hopeful that we wouldn't. Mm-hmm. We made the decision around Labor Day to pull the in person, and that was, you know, that was tough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yes. it but it was okay. Now you know you mentioned holding on to some of the virtual elements. Why did you did you decide to keep them? Well, uh, because of the feedback that we got from people who participated and enjoyed them, who, because of, you know, cost or inability to travel or, you know, the need to stay close to home, can't come to downtown Nashville. Um, People took part in the festival who have never been able to do so before. And we certainly don't intend to forget those people. We welcome them and want want more of them. Now, Gloria, you've attended the festival for many years. Tell me, what drew you in? Well, I was trying to remember when the first time I did um, host a session. I'm hosting a session that will be on Saturday morning this time. But my first session, years ago, I was um, I worked for the newspaper here, and I was a travel editor. And so I think because of that, there was a couple on the schedule that was um, had done a travel book. And so they asked me if I would host their session, and I did. And I... I was looking back to try to remember when that was. I think it might have been 2002. So it's okay. been quite a while. All right. <laughs> That's how I got there. That's how you got there. But yeah. you got there and you continued to be a part of the festival. Why did you decide to begin volunteering there? I did because I love the Festival of Books. I love to read. I like to be there. I like to be among the other readers and especially among the other writers who were there because... Um, if it, it attracts a ton of writers, mm-hmm. and that's just kind of where we want to be on, on this weekend in October. What was it like to host your first event? It was nervous-making. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I had not really—I had, I had done a lot of public speaking, but not in, a, in that kind of session. And so um, I did know from a distance Kathy and Vernon Summerlin, who were the authors. I knew them already because they'd done some freelance work that I had published in the paper. And um, so it was, it was fun to meet them. I wasn't sure how they were going to, how they were going to react to the, to the festival. And so once we got over that initial, um, that initial uh, not knowing, then, you know, everything just went really well. I mean, the one thing I've discovered is that authors know what they want to say and they're, they come in ready. I just have to be ready to draw them out. You know, I get that. I get that feeling nervous the first time out. But, you know, there's this special kind of magic that happens when you get an author in to engage in their yes. comments about the work that they've done. Yes. What do you enjoy the most? I enjoy um, hearing. I enjoy it when the authors, if I've got more than one author going, at, you know, at the same time, I enjoy, the, enjoy it when they come together, mm-hmm. um, when they start talking to one another as well as talking to the audience. I think that's the best thing about it is that uh, you can bring them out and ask the right questions, and then they suddenly start. It's like they've been best friends forever. Mm-hmm. So, And it also takes you off the hook. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> you can just fall back and I watch I just fall back and watch, have, them, and watch them go. That's, that's fantastic. Right. Yeah. Now, my next guest has been attending the festival from the very beginning. She was at the very first Southern Festival of Books in 1989. Not only is she a book lover, she is the author of the Hearts Are All on Fire, a novel. Alana White, welcome. Thank you to so this much. Is this is such a pleasure. Thank you. Really happy to have you. So, Kay, take us back to the very first festival. What was it like? Well, um, I think of it as something of a, of a godsend because um, back in 1989, uh, believe it or not, there, there weren't that many writers that I knew of, of fiction and nonfiction in Nashville. If I said I was a writer, if I wanted to admit that, um, people immediately assumed you were a songwriter. Mm. So, you know, naturally enough. So when the festival came along, it was like a, a godsend because it was books. And like Gloria said, it drew writers and still does. It's such a wonderful place. If Even if you're not presenting or you're pre-published, uh, you can go to these panels and presentations, meet other people, and also um, 
learn how to present or not present maybe, um, mm. you know, learn from watching all those others. A lot of people, I think writers groups came out of that. Um, you know, we just sort of clung to one another. And um, I don't think I've missed a festival yet. And for me, a lot of it, is, it's like going home because even just walking along the plaza, you know, you run into people you know, like I'll see Gloria, I'll see maybe someone I haven't seen in a year, or maybe I've seen them just last month, you know, mm-hmm. but um, it's just a, it's a real homecoming for me. Now, I understand that you made some very, very dear friends mm-hmm. at that time, and there was a photo taken yeah, from oh, the yes. very first oh. festival that holds some great memories for you. Can you tell me about that? I'm so glad you asked that, and I'm so happy that the festival did that 10 years ago. Um, they gathered us together on the uh, on the steps of the War Memorial Auditorium, and it was, do you mind if I list them? It was uh, for it. Kathy Pelletier, Lee Smith, Roy Blunt, Bobby Ann Mason, uh, John Edgerton, Jill McCorkle, and me. <laughs> 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 so that was that was a lot of fun. I treasure that I treasure that photograph. Now you've been there since the beginning. You haven't missed one yet. Does no. it look? pretty much the way it does today? Did it look the way it does today? Of course, it was smaller. Um, Serenity would know those facts and figures, how many authors and how many attendees, but um, it's it's much, much bigger now, and I, it's one of the finest festivals in the nation. So, of course, every writer in the world wants to come there, and it's, it's probably become a little bit more competitive. I've seen it become more diverse. Um, everyone is welcome there. Um, a lot of the writers this year. Uh, it's just a wonderful, a uh, lot of opportunities to hear a lot of great authors. I think maybe the young adult um, area maybe has bloomed um, somewhat, and that's nice to see as well. Um, also, I want to mention their fabulous app. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, it's just, you know, I thought, oh, no, an app. <laughs> and then I opened up, well, this is easy. I can do this. I mean, it's just wonderful. Technology wins. Yeah. And there are also golf carts to take you from the library up to the legislative plaza and back down again. And that can be a little bit of a trek. So that's nice. Ease on travel? Uh-huh. <laughs> not bad. Not bad at all. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville, and I'm your host, Khalil A. Colonna. We're talking this hour about the 34th annual Southern Festival of Books with event director Serenity Bergman, longtime volunteer Gloria Ballard, and author Alana White. Now, the festival has grown and has shown the ability to really adapt and make changes. I mean, it's a la- that's how it's lasted for 34 years. Serenity, what about the changes this year that the festival has made? Um, I think this year, coming back to in-person, one of the big questions we had was, what is audience going to be like? It's, you know, it's hard to know with the world coming out of a a global pandemic. So um, we do have fewer authors this year, but the fewer number is about 175. So still a lot of authors. (laughs) But in pre-COVID years, we were 225 to 250. Um, this year we'll be live streaming um, from the library auditorium, which is a new thing that we've never done before. And uh, so we're really excited about the ability to offer those sessions. And we have um, the whole festival plaza just set up for we've got our hand sanitizer. We've got our social distancing sign. We've got our masks available. We want people to feel comfortable You know, but also we want people to feel present and feel part of that community. Now, I understand you all have C-SPAN involved, right? Is that new? No, 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 no. C-SPAN has been, they are so great. Um, It's Book TV, and they cover a lot of festivals around the country, and they've been covering this festival for, gosh, at least 10 or 15 years. Um, So they'll be recording uh, sessions on Saturday in the library, and then they'll be airing live from the festival on Sunday. Now, every year there's a thematic track that runs through the entire festival. Mm -hmm. What is it this year? Mm -hmm. This is a partnership that we're so proud to do with the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities at Vanderbilt. And it's usually 10 to 15 sessions uh, that are themed. And this year, it's it's a beautiful theme. It's mending and transforming. Mm. So we're looking at and thinking about... What have we learned in COVID? How do we repair ourselves? Um, What do we want to change going forward with what we've um, collected along the way in the past couple of years? And so, you know, this this touches on sessions ranging from our familial relationships to social justice, to the law, to medicine. Um, What 
what is our role in changing what we want the world to be going forward post-COVID is really where that goes. Now, Aletta mentioned that you all have become much more diverse over the years. Can you talk about your approach to that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do it. Um, after the 25th anniversary, which is when the photo was taken that Atlanta referenced, um, we took a look at the author list sort of historically um, through that lens of are we representative, truly representative of the community? And the answer was a pretty hard no. We were not, not even close. Um, so since then, um, we've prioritized making sure that we are not just relying on what comes across, you know, our desks that's offered from major publishers, but looking for opportunities to reflect the whole community. So, for example, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the program is going to be um, persons of color. And we're going to make sure that we have an inclusion policy that makes gay and trans people feel extremely comfortable being their true selves on the plaza. Um, you know, we don't have a huge budget for supporting authors. We're really dependent upon tours for who comes to the festival. But with the funds that we do have, we make sure that we um, have inclusivity as a high priority there as well. Now, Gloria, given your history with the event, you know, you've been with there more than a decade. What are your favorite sessions that you've attended <laughs> or hosted? My favorite sessions have been the ones where... Um, I am allowed to listen to a variety of, of writers. Um, my most favorite, and actually the most challenging, was the year that um, two authors, Kendra Allen and Jenny Capo Crusset, were here. Um, not only was were they, there was some controversy around uh, Janine's book, and so there was that going on. Um, and also, it was a year, the first year and the only year so far, that I've done a live C-SPAN thing. Okay. So I not only, so I had, <laughs> I had the, the two authors, I had the live C-SPAN, I was a little nervous, something else was going on. Um, and it went off just fine because the two authors really, it's like they became best friends by the end of that by the end of that session. So I was thinking, oh, okay, it's over, good. <laughs> but it was great. But I've also enjoyed... Um, some others. I've had two sessions where I have talked about uh, Eudora Welty's gardens. I'm a gardener, and we've had two two uh, two authors that focus on her letters and her gardens. Um, I've had several sessions where they have focused on um, short stories, like a panel of short story writers, and I love reading short stories. Um, Two or three, well, right before the pandemic in 2019, I think there was a session with two YA authors. If I'm if I'm choosing a book to read, I probably would not choose YA, mm -hmm. young adult authors. But um, I had the best time first reading these mm -hmm. books and then talking to the two authors. And this year, I have two other uh, two other YA young adult authors that I'm going to be interviewing on Saturday morning. So. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So why is YA your new favorite genre? It's not my new favorite, <laughs> but, but it is a genre that I understand a lot better now mm -hmm. than I did before um, because, you know, what I see is that they're very, uh, very unafraid to present life as the way it is right now. Mm -hmm. And um, and they are, um, they're, an, they're amazing writers. I mean, you know, the, the YA authors can just really, you know, they go there. And um, and it's 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 fun to see. It's good to see that. So, yeah. You know, I hear that a lot of YA audience is not really exactly very young. Alana, right. is that right? <laughs> right, right, right. No. Um, in fact, a lot of adults read young adult fiction because many times the uh, protagonist will be uh, late teens, early 20s or whatever. Um, a lot of really good uh, historical YAs being done right now, like... Um, the Light in Hidden Places by Sharon Cameron, uh, who's going to be at the festival. She's just wonderful. And I know my adult book club just had a wonderful time with her. She came and presented to us. So, yeah, that's the thing about the festival, too, is you make a lot of discoveries. Um, even if, you, if you've got an hour between something, two things you really want to see, if you just drop in to a room, walk in, many times you'll discover a new author and, um, I know one time I, I did that, and it was a children's illustrator, and it was wonderful. I enjoyed that as much as I've enjoyed anything 
uh, that I've mm-hmm. gone to there. That was that was great. I enjoyed that. So what are what are one of your favorite festival moments? Well, I was telling Serenity um, earlier, I remember going into the, uh, they have a hospitality room for the authors to go into, and I walked in, and there sat uh, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter and Alex Haley. Wow. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I walked into a dream, <laughs> and she told me that was uh, 1989, so here we are kind of full circle. Mm-hmm. I remember um, getting up my courage and walking up to Charles Frazier, who wrote uh, Cole Mountain in the, on the plaza one day. And he was, he was such a gentleman, so kind, so nice. We took a photo. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just wonderful moments like that. Now, Serenity, I also heard reading somewhere that Justice Sotomayor showed oh, up. Yeah. She did, yes. That was such a great, beautiful event. Um, I think it was 2018. Um, we were incredibly fortunate to have her. She appeared in War Memorial Auditorium. We gave away 500 books in mm. conjunction with that. That was underwritten by a very generous uh, donor. So when we're able to have opportunities like that where you see all generations, whole families come out and just mm. you know that they're experiencing a, a magical moment, it, it means something's very special. What's one of your most memorable special moments? Um. So this is really going to date me, but um, it it was probably my first or second year, and I was tasked with um, walking uh, the writer Horton Foote, who um, is probably best known now as the Oscar-winning writer of the screenplay for the movie To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. Um, He's also a really famous playwright, um, and he was at the festival, and I just had to move him from, you know, point A to point B. Uh, took about 10 minutes, and he, he was el- he was probably 80, 80 then. He was elderly. And I was super, you know, busy, hot and sweaty, 10,000 things to do. And I walked into the lobby of the hotel, and he was just sitting in the chair there. And he was – he had this just real calming – you know, some people just make you feel calm and at ease. And he had that kind of a presence – to him and we you know took a little walk down to the library and delivered him where he was meant to be and um i've remembered it ever since 10 minutes it was great 10 minutes did you did you talk or was it a walk in silence no 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 we (laughs) talked he was very chatty you know he wanted to know all about the festival and about the town and you know where to eat and that kind of thing and um you know just regular chit chat nothing special but Mm -hmm. definitely a very special person (laughs) Mm -hmm. i I like that that presence that can Mm -hmm. just change your entire Mm -hmm. day and perspective apparently right yes for sure so we know there's a lot of books and authors what else can folks expect i'm so glad you asked this question because i love talking about this and we don't get asked it a lot so the you know the festival is called a festival for a reason um it's a celebration so we have it's great food trucks. We have a beer garden um, with Yazoo and Bearded Iris, which they generously donate to us. We have about 50 to 60 vendor booths on the plaza where you can shop books and book-related things and talk to people from local nonprofits. We have headquarters where you can buy merch. We have a whole children's area down in Church Street Park that Turnip Green Reuse and the Nashville Downtown Partnership are spearheading activities and fun things down there. We have a music stage. You know, you can't do Nashville without great music. Mm -hmm. It goes all weekend. It's completely free. You come out, have a beer, eat from a food truck, listen to great music. We have a performing arts stage. Same thing. Nashville Shakespeare Festival, Southern Word, other groups will be performing. So there is this whole really um, big, fun, festive outdoor component that you can come and enjoy, um, whether you feel like you want to go to an author session or not. We hope you do, but you certainly don't have to. And um, Parnassus has a huge book sales tent there. They sell the books of all the authors on the program. And um, you can get books signed. Every author signs books. So I really want to make the point that um, it, it really is for everyone. It's a free community event. I love what you just said there, particularly one word, free. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Why? Not the food and the beer, though. <laughs> Not, yeah, you have to pay for your beer. Okay, yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. That away. <laughs> That's reasonable. But Serenity, why is it so important that this event is free and remains be, to be free? Well, Humanities Tennessee, which is the presenting organization, you know, we are a nonprofit. Um, we do work all over the state. The festival is our biggest and, and best known single program. Um, but it's part of our mission that um, 
people believe in and should have access to lifelong learning um, and lifelong intellectual engagement. And that, you know, is easier when you're in school and harder when you're out of school. Mm -hmm. And so we have very intentionally kept this festival free um, for this many years for that reason. We don't want cost to be a barrier for anyone who has an interest. That is Serenity Gerbman, director of the Southern Festival of Books. She was joined by longtime volunteer Gloria Ballard and day one attendee and author Alana White. I want to thank you all for being with us today. Really appreciate it and have fun at the festival. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so much. Thank you for having, having us. Thanks for having us. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll meet some of the authors featured at this year's festival. Have you attended the Southern Festival of Books? We'd love to hear about it. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. Kaliole Colonna, and this is Nashville. Friday marks the first day of the 34th annual Southern Festival of Books. This free, family-friendly event draws people from all over the state and the country to come and celebrate their shared love of literature. But what is a book festival without authors, right? My next guests have worked, have their work, Featured at this year's festival, Francesca Royster is the author of Black Country Music, Listening for Revolutions. She is joined by poet and Vanderbilt professor Major Jackson, author of a new book, A Beat Beyond. Francesca, Major, welcome to This is Nashville. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here, Khalil, and also excited to talk to you, Major. Here, here. Wonderful. I love this. So, you know, Francesca, tell me, tell me about your new book, Black Country Music, Listening for Revolutions. Sure. Um, well, my book, in some ways, is very much connected to the theme of the Festival of Mending and Transformation. It's a book about um, looking at country music as a genre through a Black um, queer feminist lens. And so necessarily kind of thinking about performers who shift the way that we hear country music um, and think about its history. And it's it's kind of part musical analysis and part memoir. Um, and I'm very excited to, to share it. You know, last night I read the intro and I was drawn in when you highlighted country music's roots to the minstrel music of the early 1800s. You call it country music's haunted history. And you, you go on to express like comparisons of what black performers endured in that era and what contemporary artists endure today. You even spoke of wanting to protect contemporary artists from spaces where they're not fully accepted, let alone welcome. That's 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 pretty heavy. Yeah, you know, it is. It's it's partly coming out of my conversations with some artists and also with fans of country music who are African American who've um, felt unsafe and who felt like, um, you know, their love of the genre has to be something that they do in private. And, um, and that's kind of partly that feeling of protection, the ways that country has sometimes been used as, you know, a, as a weapon or as a soundtrack um, of violence against Black people. And also the ways that the history of country music has often marginalized or put um, yeah, decentered African American contributions, so that it sometimes feels like a music um, that's not for us, or a music whose stories aren't our stories. And one of the joys of learning more about Black country music performers is the ways that they're bringing those stories of Black life and Black joy, and also struggle to the center through their music. What was the emotional emotional journey like for you as you were writing this book? Oh, I love that question. I first got the idea of talking to my dad, who uh, Philip Royster, who is an English professor too, and uh, was a sessions musician in Nashville in the 70s. And just hearing his excitement about that time and about connecting with country music, um, when I was talking to him about it, um, I was also just really curious about the ways that 
you know, for me as someone who is pretty well versed in African American culture and, you know, as a teacher, but also, you know, someone who's deep into African American music of different genres, country music still felt like an unexplored territory and even a taboo. So um, as I really dug in um, and learned about folks who I knew well, but who also did country music like Tina Turner or artists who are really um, newer and claiming country music as their home, like Mickey Guyton or uh, Darius Rucker, um, I really started getting excited. And I also uh, decided to learn the banjo um, mm. as a way of reclaiming the instrument, um, since the banjo is an, a, an instrument with African roots, um, and also um, as a way of kind of thinking about music in a more embodied way. And it was very healing to learn. I had a, a wonderful teacher, Suli Greg Wilson, uh, one of the founding members of the Carolina Chocolate Drops. And because of the pandemic, I had access to this wonderful teacher um, through Zoom. And it was just wonderful to use the banter to think about what felt familiar and less familiar about this music and uh, really kind of learn about the roots of country music that way. Mm -hmm. I do want to give a shout out to the Black Opry, which we featured on the show a while back. Now, Major, yeah. tell, tell, yes. tell me a little bit about your newest book, A Beat Beyond. Sure. Um, a Beat Beyond uh, is a collection of essays and talks that I've given over the years blog post. It was edited by one of Francesca's uh, colleagues at DePaul University, Amor Coley. Want to make sure I acknowledge him. Um, I started off as a writer of uh, hip hop, and it was Amor who kind of mm -hmm. saw the connection between my life as a writer and my life as as someone who loves, uh, loves music. Um, the book, um, and what I've noticed is that so much of of my writing has been a way of me learning and researching and studying uh, poets who are important to me, like Gwendolyn Brooks and County Cullen, um, and mentors like Garrett Hongo, who's being honored as we speak at uh, University of, of the South in Sewanee. So I finally, after 20 something years, decided to pull these essays together with the help of Amor. And it was fantastic to notice that I had made a bit of a drop um, in uh, essays, which I hadn't expected when I first started writing as a, as a poet. Now, you know, you were a hip hop columnist and you're <laughs> a poetry professor, you know, talk to me about those themes that that, that draw closely. How is, you know, Pasta News or Trugoy from De La Soul? How are I they? I knew you were going to say their names. Uh, uh, the, those, are my, those are my boys. Anybody who's listened to the show knows that. And, you know, how are they, like, reminiscent of the Langston Hughes and Calty Collins of their era? Yeah, you know, those particular poets, it's, interestingly enough, I call them poets. Those yeah. rappers, those hip-hop artists, were my introduction to language and language as a form of wit, language as a form of representation, language as a way of addressing issues in our, um, in our lives and culture that may not be spoken about at the dinner table. So there was something for me quite radical um, when, I, when I first encountered hip hop artists that was different in the way that other or the larger mainstream, uh, particularly older folks, was hearing hip hop. It was really an induction and, and indoctrination to the power of language. Mm. Now, you've been in Nashville for a while. What are your thoughts on Music City offering much more than just country music and honky tonk? Slight clarification I spent summers here. My family is from Nashville and from ages two to 12. Um, I was here in Nashville and returned two years ago, uh, 40 years later. So okay. uh, it's what I've noticed is the gorgeous amount of culture and change um, from when I was m much younger here. Um, not just physically the landscape, but you can walk down the street and uh, see some of that that the wealth of humanity that this place draws uh, a lot of it owed, of course to 
uh, to the to the music scene, but I would argue that there are artists of all kinds here. Um, and what the festival does, the book festival does, I think, is spotlight uh, not just the history of writers here um, in Nashville, but the writers that continue to come. My next guest is a first-time author whose book, The Mountains We Carry, is being featured at the festival. Dr. Zaid Rifkani, welcome to This Is Nashville. Thanks for joining us, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Now, let me start by offering my congratulations on being a first-time author. I'm sure this has got to be a pretty exciting time for you. Now, tell me a little bit about your book, The Mountains We Carry. Yes, it's uh, quite exciting. Uh, the The Mountains We Carry is a novel uh, which is a fiction based on uh, real events or true events of the genocidal campaign, uh, also uh, known as Anfal Campaign, which was carried on by the Iraqi um, government against the Kurdish minority in, in Iraq, and this happened in 1988. So this novel uh, tells the story of a Kurdish family that is separated and torn apart during uh, the genocide. And uh, there's three main characters, and each character tells their story from uh, from their from their side, from their perspective. But the main the main character Azad, who is a young uh, Kurd who uh, insists on staying in the city of Dohuk to study and uh, reaches his goal of. Uh, studying English and going to college. And when this uh, genocide takes place, he's separated from his mother, two sisters, and her, from his uh, fiance in the village. So, so the story tells, this novel tells their story across uh, borders and concentration camps and also in refugee camps in Turkey. Also, uh, some like a lot of loss and, and tragedy that, that happens to them in Iran until the surviving people or members of this family reach the United States and specifically in Nashville. So it tells the story and the struggle of the Kurdish uh, uh, Kurdish people. And it has, it has a local relevance because Nashville um, has the, is also known as Little Kurdistan mm -hmm. and Nashville has the largest Kurdish population in North America. So I'm very happy that uh, I'll be presenting this book and get uh, our readers an opportunity to learn about the Kurdish culture, about the Kurdish struggle and the Kurdish population in Nashville. Now, you this book, based off of these fictional accounts, what has the reception been like from the Kurdish community here in town? Uh, well, so the the the, the genocide. Uh, that, that took place involved or affected the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, a very large uh, portion of the Kurdish population in Nashville are survivors of that uh, genocide. So um, they their feedback so far has been uh, great. They, they, uh, each one of them would find something in this novel that they feel like resonates with some of their struggles. And also the feedback has been great from the second and third generation uh, young Kurds who did not live at that time, uh, did not witness those uh, um, uh, events, but uh, feel a great deal of appreciation to be able to get a lens on, on these events that happened, uh, that happened at that time. So to be able to learn uh, you know, parts of their history and the, the the struggle of the of the Kurdish nation and also you know all the non-Kurds and the friends of the Kurds who are interested in learning about the Kurdish history and the, the culture and the struggle uh, the feedback so far has been great and I'm very um, very blessed uh, to to see that mm -hmm. now now Francesca I understand that you spent part of your childhood here tell me what does it mean for you to discuss this book here in Nashville Yep, that's right. Um, kind of like major, uh, the, almost the same number of years, probably a little earlier in time. But um, I was living in Nashville from age two to about 12. And being here, I think, is so exciting, you know, kind of being part of this particular festival. My mom uh, worked at the Nashville Public Library um, back in the day um, for Read and Rap, which is this community center. Um, that came out of the National Public, Nashville Public Library. So I'm kind of, I'm just really excited to 
be a part of the community, um, but also, you know, thinking about, of course, the ways that Nashville as, you know, Music City um, has these dominant, um, you know, the dominant role of country music and really kind of talking to people who care about country music and also who care about black life and maybe bringing those things together. Um, while I'm here, I really, really want to go to the Jefferson Street Sound Museum mm -hmm. um, and really think about um, those efforts to memorialize um, black music making, you know, on, along Jefferson Street as well, and um, kind of think about that in reference to my own work. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited to be in Nashville and also at the fest particularly. Now, Major, I understand that you proclaimed that you will never move to a city that doesn't have a book festival. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. I think it's partially my huge belief in the fact that book festivals, in a way, um, underscore values of exchange and, and dialogue, which I think are important in a democracy. And I think a book festival uh, says a lot about community and receptivity. Um, it says a lot about how we value uh, storytelling, how we value um, uh, poems and essays. Um, and hopefully this filters out into, um, into other areas of, of our lives. I, I also say that because so many of my friends I get to reunion with uh, when we see each other at book festivals like uh, Southern Festival of the Book. So it's wonderful. Now, as Zaid, you know, you mentioned that many people in the Kurdish community are familiar with the events of the Anfal campaign, but people are still they're responding to your book. So tell me, what do you think is special about books as a way of conveying stories? We got about I think, a minute, uh, one a minute of, and a half uh, left. Yes. Uh, one of the biggest things that reading teaches us is, uh, you know, make teach us to be humble and uh, force us to sit down and uh, program ourselves to be able to listen to something. And uh, no matter what perspective we have to be able to listen to the other side in a quiet way. And that's what the reading offers us in a world that is full of uh, noise and full of uh, hate uh, that to be able to sit down and listen to uh, a voice on the other side. And uh, I think that is very important for us to connect with each other, especially in a great city like Nashville that is uh, experiencing a great deal of uh, diversity and growth. And I'm just uh, very excited to be part of this festival and look forward to meeting everybody there. What are you hoping for? This is your first festival, your first book. What are you hoping for? Yes, I I just uh, I, I really would like to uh, to be able to get out the voice of the Kurds out there that we are part of the uh, of the fabric of this great country of this great city and that uh, I would like for people to know the Kurds are, are as not just a minority that has been oppressed but also as a people with great history and culture and contribution to uh, society and humanity. And that despite these genocides, we are not just victims, but rather we are survivors. Mm -hmm. And that is an important message to deliver to people. And so we can all carry each other through these difficult times. That is Dr. Zaid Rifkani. He was joined by Francesca Royster and Major Jackson. All three will be appearing at this year's Southern Festival of the Books. Thank you so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. The 34th Annual Southern Festival of Books begins this Friday, October 14th at noon and runs through the weekend at Nashville Public Library, War Memorial Auditorium, and War Memorial Plaza. As you've heard earlier this hour, the festival isn't just for Southern writers, but we do want to let you know about some of the Nashville authors who will be there. That list includes Margot Price, Mary Laura Philpott, Ruta Cepetis, Joy Jordan Lake, Andrew Moranis, Lisa Dordal, Jill Anderson, Helene Dunbar, Jessica Young, Kristen Tubb, Erica Waters, Roy Heron, R.J. Jacobs, James Hobbler, and that's not even all of them. We also want to give a special shout out to some of the festival authors who have been guests on this show. Dr. Alex Jahangir, Nashville's former COVID task force leader, is the author of Hotspot, a doctor's diary of From the Pandemic. 
Aaron Dieterwolf is co-author of Mastodons to Mississippians, Adventures in Nashville's Deep Past. Marissa R. Moss, the author of Her Country, How Women of Country Music Became the Successes They Were Never Supposed to Be. And Becca Andrews is the author of No Choice, The Destruction of Roe v. Wade and the Fight to Protect a Fundamental American Right. We got links to the full author list and festival schedule on the web post for this episode at thisisnashville.org. We want to thank everyone who tuned in this hour. Tomorrow, the latest January 6th congressional hearing will preempt our show, but don't worry. We'll be back live on Friday. Same time, same place. This is Nashville is a production of WPLN News and Nashville Public Radio. Listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Our producers are Steve Harosh and Steve Harush and Rose Gilbert. Our digital lead is Anna Gallegos Cannon. Michaela Elias is our technical director. Our executive producer is Andrea Tutho. Shout out to our intern Tori Hoover, the masterminds behind our theme music, Ola Ranj and Namir Blade. Special thanks to Nancy Floyd. The conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at this is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil Ekelona. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. And be good to each other.